Nibi. Um, and um, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, it's a real, real pleasure to um, to give one of these uh, anniversary talks. Um, I am um, I struggle to believe it's said. Uh, you know, the the, the centre has been going ten years, um, and struggle even more to um, to to think that um, Project Vimto has has essentially been going for um, for, for most of that uh, time. Um, it's been going been going quite a while, and it's um, it's it's been uh, quite a challenge at times. There've been some real practical challenges, but we've um, we've kind of kept nudging the project forwards. Um, and so this afternoon, um, Tobias and I would would like to uh, to tell you a bit about the Vimto story and um, and where we've got to um, uh, working on this particular um, problem of trying to derive something we call rail roughness spectra from axle box vibration. Um, so the title's a bit cryptic, hopefully it'll all become clear. Um, Didi mentioned questions. I can't quite see chat uh, boxes, etc. So do, um, if anybody wants to uh, inter interrupt, they could do so via DD or, or we'll certainly collect all those questions, any questions at the end. Um, okay, so the first thing I really want to say um, is although Tobias and I will be speaking this afternoon, um, this project would not be possible, uh, not being possible without uh, a number of uh, people. Um, and first and foremost amongst those are the names I've put up here. And in particular, um, I'd like to acknowledge that um, the really um, essential contributions from uh, Paul Fiddler. Um, many of you will know Paul um, as a longstanding member of CSIC. Um, Paul has helped um, on numerous occasions and um, together with Simon Hartley, who um, was a postdoc with the center um, for two or three years. Um, uh, Simon uh, also contributed to the project over a year or so. Um, and, um, and the three of us, um, uh, well, we couldn't, have, we couldn't have got the tram instrumented without Paul and Simon. So a huge debt of gratitude to the, those two colleagues. Um, James, and, we, can't, we can't see your screen, your shared screen. Oh, goodness me. I'm very sorry. Thank there you, Dee Dee. Thank Perfect. you. Oh, God. So you had to put up with me all that time, did you? Um, uh, OK, so those are, the, those are the names there. Tobias and um, uh, uh, Tobias, uh, Paul Fiddler, Simon Harley. Andrew was a, a, a fourth year project student with me um, and, uh, and he, he helped get um, the, the initial project off the ground as well. Um, so um, let's, um, let's move on. Um, there we go. So the inspiration, where did this project come from? Um, it, 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 it started really, uh, the, the inspiration um, goes back uh, even further, it goes back to um, uh, uh, the, my postdoctoral project, which was um, back in 2001. Uh, sorry, not two, yes, 2001, 2003. Um, and um, this was a project known as Convert. We were, we were working, it was quite a large EU funded project. Uh, we've got uh, the, the partners here, there's a number of academic partners, a uh, number of uh, industrial consultancies and, and, and suppliers, um, and, um, and three metro operators, most notably uh, London Underground, um, who we'll, uh, we'll return to um, a bit later on. Um, we were all working on this project Convert, the control of noise and vibration from underground railway tunnels. Um, this is a problem which um, perhaps not many people have uh, thought about unless they happen to live uh, close to an underground railway. Um, you, when, we, when we look at railways, uh, when we look at rails in particular, you see these nice shiny uh, steel rails um, and you think, well, what could possibly be the problem? Um, if you zoom in and look at the micron level, there really is an inherent roughness to those uh, rail heads. Um, but when we roll a, a, a railway wheel along, um, it generates quite significant uh, dynamic forces that drive, generate vibration. The vib vibration propagates through the track bed into the tunnel, and then that tunnel radiates groundborne vibration out into the ground. And of course, once it's in the ground, it can, it can propagate up into buildings uh, where it causes disturbance. Um, it can cause disturbance in the form of perceptible vibration. 
uh, people can feel it, um, or probably more likely they, they hear it. They hear it in the form of re-radiated noise where elements of the, of the uh, building uh, act like speakers essentially and radiate, uh, the, vib the vibrating surfaces radiate sound. And so you get this low frequency rumble that's particularly annoying if you're, particularly if you're trying to get to sleep or something like that. It's particularly annoying if you're trying to run uh, a specialist building, maybe a, a concert hall or a recording studio. And if the vibration is, is, um, is sufficiently high, it'll inter interfere with the operation of sensitive machines, electron microscopes, if you're trying to run a hospital or... Um, so there are lots of, um, lots of locations where if they're too close to an underground railway, they, they can really suffer. Um, it's increasingly, therefore, a focus of railway operators to help control this, uh, um, control this problem and control it, controlling it at, it at its source by managing the rail roughness. Um, so one of the things one of the things we did as part of Convert was a series of measurements that um, uh, helped validate our numerical. It's essentially a theoretical project about developing numerical models. Um, one of the things we did to help validate those was to instrument a, a train um, uh, uh, with the help of London Underground, um, and, um, and and we sort of characterised the, the source, if you like, by by measuring vibration on on the train. Um, and, and, and out of that came this, this, this concept of, of monitoring using the, the rail vehicle itself. So uh, as, as, the, as the nice thing about the, the vehicles is that they're obviously running, traversing the network on a daily basis, many times uh, a day in the case of a, a small metro. Um, there's the potential to continuously uh, monitor the, the track infrastructure. Um, and of course with modern, modern uh, Wi-Fi techniques and, and the internet, the idea of being able to relay uh, monitoring data in real time to a, to a database uh, and, and allow operators to, to track the roughness in some way. Um, um, and uh, you know, that, that helps um, control the problem from a ground or vibration perspective. Of course, it also helps them um, schedule their maintenance. So the idea of some sort of optimized maintenance strategy based on this con continuous monitoring. Okay, so that's, a, that's the concept. Um, uh, Convert came to an end and we, we all went our separate ways. Although um, the nice thing with, uh, with the community is that we, we all managed to keep in touch essentially. Um, I, I did some work, uh, uh, some consultancy work with um, Nottingham Trams. This was looking at a, a controlling noise and vibration in the Royal Concert Hall. Um, and what, what was evident working on this project was just how basic some of the, the monitoring, if, if you can call it that, that, that's undertaken by small operators. Um, uh, most of the monitoring is essentially visual, you know, uh, walking, the, walking the track, looking at the condition of the railhead. Um, perhaps if you're lucky, getting out a straight edge now and again and trying to assess really, really bad sections of, of, uh, of rail. Um, Occasionally, they might use something called a cat, which we'll return to, but, but basically it's a very manual process. And that, and that continued to uh, uh, sort of inspire me in terms of getting this project off the ground. Uh, we couldn't quite get persuade um, Nottingham Trams to install instrumentation. So when I returned to Cambridge, one of the first things I was really keen to do was to get this project off the ground. Um, and I did this with um, Andrew Lees as his, part of his 2B two, uh, two fourth year project. And this followed a very fortuitous meeting with a gentleman called Colin Roby in Centro. Um, he very kindly gave us uh, access to um, one of their trams. Centro, um, as was, um, uh, ran the, uh, the West Midlands Rail uh, link, which um, uh, connects Wolverhampton um, to Birmingham, Birmingham to Wolverhampton in the West Midlands. Um, and they were fantastic. They were very much a can-do uh, operation who, um, who uh, remarkably let us, uh, let Andrew put, uh, put his box of tricks there on, on this bit of steel plate, which, which is part of, the, um, part of the, the, the wheel arrangement here. You can see we've got the, the end of the axle here, the wheel, and the primary suspension in the form of these rubber elements here. So that whole wheel bounces up and down on the primary suspension. 
Um, but it is remarkably close to the, the wheel rail interface. So the idea that we've essentially got this, um, this, this wheel that can measure the profile of the, of the rail in some way um, through the vibration. And if we measure that vibration as close as possible, uh, we, might, we might be in, in with a chance. Um, Andrew, um, Andrew did some great work with a little Arduino and an accelerometer and, and capturing some measurements. Won't go into too much detail. You can, you can see here he's plotted some results. This is um, the RMS. Um, he's called it RMS roughness. It's not really, it's a pseudo roughness. It's basically the RMS acceleration level measured by that accelerometer. And it's uh, measured along the track. Um, and you can see basically all I want you to take away from this is that there are areas of track which give relatively high vibration levels and some which give relatively few. That was enough to um, really engage Centro um, and, um, and they, they allowed us to take this project one step further. And this was really the birth of Vinto. Why this silly acronym? Uh, I think it was really Colin and I having a bit of a joke. Um, it actually, I was quite pleased with it. Vinto vibration and impact monitoring of tram operations. Um, uh, no, no project is worth its salt unless it's got a funny acronym. Um, and um, uh, we, we set this up with, um, with Centro, providing a huge amount of in-kind support, um, granting us uh, access, ready access to one of their trams, uh, one of their service trams, which uh, through CSIC, and as I say, through uh, in particular the efforts of um, Paul Fiddler, Simon Hartley and, and me, we, we, we managed to instrument a tram, um, which, um, if, uh, if you ask Paul or, or me about it another time, we can bore you with all sorts of um, uh, crazy stories trying to get instrumentation on this tram. The trams are now um, pink. This was the sort of second generation tram. You can see the network there, essentially straight line track from Birmingham to Wolverhampton. We, um, we'd identified, this is the bogey here on the left-hand side. You can see the wheels at each end, primary suspension, and then this structure in between, which is known as the axle beam. There's the axle beam in the right-hand side. We've got, we've got just one end of it. And we identified a particularly convenient location for our accelerometers. That's one of the installations. The accelerometer is buried away behind this um, plastic trunking that carries the cables. Um, and part of the fun we had was trying to get this all cabled up. Um, we ended up with five accelerometers, four at the front on, the, on this power bogey, um, and, and one on one of the trailing uh, bogies, all cabled back to the cab with a data acquisition unit and a GPS and Wi-Fi antenna. Um, and um, yeah, we got the GPS working to, to, to uh, give us a continuous readout of the uh, location and speed of the tram. Speed is really important as, as we'll see later. Um, and we got lots of excellent data over a remarkably long period. There were, there were significant outages at times. Uh, again, all sorts of exciting stories there. But um, we essentially got data over a period of um, about two years. Um, and um, not going to give, go into too much detail again, but the, um, this was really um, instrumental in, in demonstrating the concept. We, we, um, We've got here a similar plot to what I had for Andrew, but um, we've now got our RMS acceleration in G. You can see how high these accelerations are, 30 G, 30 times the acceleration due to gravity, F equals MA, take the mass of a wheel, um, and you realize just how high some of these dynamic forces are, um, and hence the, the, the propensity to generate considerable vibration. You can see here, um, as we plot the distance from um, a particular station, we've got our station stops in, in black squares here along the bottom. And over this um, 20, 20 kilometer length of track, you can see that how the vibration levels vary. There are, there are discrete features which we can attribute to um, things like points um, or maybe um, dip joints in the rails where, where there's been a bit of deterioration of the track. Those are discrete features which which we're actually um, putting to one side at the moment. Um, what we're really interested in is the inherent uh, background roughness, which is essentially a random roughness profile along the length of the railhead. Um, there are some sections which are really quite bad on the, on the left-hand side here, this grayed out data, um, um, and some sections which are rather good. Um, and in particular, this 
down at the, uh, in the left hand corner here, this section is rather good because it's just been replaced um, in October 2017. That track shed section was replaced and you can see how an improvement in the rail condition can lead to a dramatic Im improvement in vibration levels. Uh, various other features uh, in general, you know, it's, it's very repeatable. So if you take um, if you take the same vehicle and run it back and forth along the same section of track over a, you know, a, a period of months or even years, the vibration levels can be um, remarkably stable. There are other um, features which um, Tobias will touch on. If you look at the data in more detail, um, you can actually see that things don't remain as constant as you might think. Okay, so that was that initial uh, uh, Vimto work, which we were all really pleased with, um, and um, gave us a sort of tantalizing glimpse of what might be possible. Um, if we're honest, really, uh, the, the, the data processing there is rather crude. All, all we're doing is we're plotting vibration level, RMS, root mean square vibration level, as an indication of what the quality of the uh, uh, rail, rail is. Um, what we're really interested in is uh, a bit more detail in what's going on with the rail um, and in particular something that's known as the roughness spectrum. You can imagine if you've got a, 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 a roughness profile, a displacement profile along the rail head, we can break that down into a, um, a spectrum of wavelengths. There'll be, there'll be long wavelengths, you know, of the order of a meter or even 10 meters that are as a result of the, um, the hot rolling process, you know, that, that, uh, that derive from the process of manufacture. And then there are the, uh, the other extreme, there are the really short wavelengths, a millimeter, you know, that sort of order. Um, um, we're interested in a particular wavelength range, um, the wavelength range here from, a, from about um, 10 millimeters up to a meter or so. That's known as the acoustic roughness. And it's those wavelengths that um, really um, drive the noise and vibration. If you imagine here, so this, this, this spectrum just gives us the level, it's on a decibel scale, so it's a logarithmic scale, um, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the roughness amplitude, if you like, as a function of wavelength. Um, and you might imagine, say here, we've got uh, um, 100 millimeters. Well, if you take a, a vehicle running at 10 meters per second, um, you know, 36 kilometers an hour, 10 meters per second, running over a wavelength of 10 millimeters, we're generating vibration uh, of the order of a kilohertz. So that's right in the middle of uh, human perception, uh, uh, you know, acoustic perception, um, and, and hence, um, you know, significant. This is, a, this is a, a, a defined roughness spectrum. It's defined in the ISO standard that helps govern rail uh, quality. Um, and if you can, you know, operators strive to, 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 to remain below this um, ISO limit. And what you sometimes find is that, you know, you might, uh, you might have a spectrum that nicely uh, fits below that limit, but over a very narrow wavelength range, we get a, we get a spike in the, in the roughness spectrum. And that's, uh, that's indicative of something we call corrugation, where this essentially random roughness profile develops over time into a, a periodic roughness. It's dominated by one wavelength component. And that's when it gets really annoying. That's when you, um, that's when you sit on the underground and you, and, and you almost want to put your hands over your ears as, as the, wheel, uh, the, the, the wheels running on the, on the roughness, you know, generate that sort of whining noise that um, is really quite, really quite dreadful. Um, so operators really want to avoid corrugation. And like any, uh, it's, it, there's sort of a self-excited mechanism in there, like any self-excited mechanism, if you can nip the problem in the bud, then, um, then that's, uh, that's half the battle. So looking for little spikes developing in your roughness spectrum is something that operators want to avoid. If we can, if we can generate roughness spectra on a, on a regular basis through a continuous monitoring system, then that's kind of the holy grail. Okay, so we're almost about to hand over to Tobias here. We're now at the, situ now at the point where um, uh, Transport for London, London Underground uh, are back with us um, and they've been uh, hugely helpful, the track engineering team uh, as part of London Underground, been hugely helpful in giving us access to uh, data from, from their own 
um, track monitoring system. It's known as the ATMS, the Automatic Track Monitoring System. They record um, essentially RMS uh, vibration levels from these yellow accelerometers here. Um, uh, at the end, essentially at the ends of the, uh, these solid axles that uh, we see on, on London Underground stock. Um, and what's more, not only have they given us access to their ATMS data, they've given us access to their CAT data. I mentioned the CAT earlier, the corrugation analysis trolley. There's a whole new story, a whole, a whole other story uh, behind the CAT. Um, uh, a, a former uh, member of the department, Stuart Grassi, uh, spun out the CAT from, from the department, uh, having done his PhD with, um, uh, with the, the dynamics group here. Um, and uh, Ken, Ken Johnson was a supervisor. Um, and the CAT has, been, has become the standard for monitoring uh, rail roughness, but it remains a manual system. Um, and, um, and so what we're, we're, we're trying to do now is give London Underground a means of uh, um, analyzing their data in such a way that they can extract roughness spectra um, and, the, and the key data sets, which Tobias will, will, will talk you through, um, are helping us to, to develop that data processing. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, all for me for now. Um, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass you over to um, Tobias, who can tell you about his work on his PhD. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'm going to uh, talk through a little bit about um, how I've um, how I've developed a, a new technique to derive roughness from axle box acceleration. Um, an accelerometer mounted on, an, on the axle box, it simply measures the vertical vibration of the wheel as it rolls over the roughness on the rail. This top graph shows the axle box acceleration, which, uh, which I'll show them to ABBA, not to be confused with the pop group of the same name. This is what it looks like in several sections of track between station stops. This is the actual time history, not, um, not the um, RMS. And uh, you can see that the vibration generally increases as the, the train speed increases. And there are some areas where the underlying rail roughness is greater, or uh, there's a, uh, for example, there's a joint or a, or a squat, for example. And this measurement is influenced by not not only the speed of the train, but also the dynamic properties of the train and the track, which act as a filter between the roughness and ABBA. So to compensate for this, I need to model the train track system. This represents one of the wheels, which is in contact with the rail for a roughness profile. And this system can be represented as a transfer function in the frequency domain which determines the amount of ABBA that occurs for a given hour of roughness at each, each frequency of oscillation or um, wavelength or, or um, the vehicle speed divided by wavelength. So to get rail roughness, we simply invert the transfer function. Then I need to take the spectrum of ABBA, which is the amount or power in the section of ABBA signal, a bit like the RMS, but it is broken down into a a series of frequency bands, bands as, as Jane said. And um, more, specific, more specifically, for those who are interested, uh, it's actually the power spectral density I'm calculating, which is a statistical measure of a section of ABBA signal. So I'm effectively using random process theory. Now, if I divide the ABBA PSD by the transfer function, I get the frequency spectrum of the rail roughness, but this is still in the train's reference frame. So, which means that as the train speed increases, the frequency content of the signal increases for a given wavelength of the underlying roughness. So the final step is to translate the frequencies to wavelengths along the track according to the train speed. And here we have de derived the wavelength spectrum of roughness from ABBA and compensated for the train speed in the train track dynamics. Now I need a clean environment in which to test this technique of deriving rail roughness from ABBA. 
So I have developed a simulator to calculate an ABBA signal from a roughness profile in the time domain, from which I'll attempt to derive the roughness from and compare with the original roughness. Firstly, I generate a, a roughness profile for the simulator, and I chose this um, standard roughness spectrum that James showed you, uh, and I've added a sine wave component at 100 millimeters to represent corrugation. Um, this standard spectrum is close to the typical roughness of well-maintained track without the corrugation peak, and it is plotted at wavelengths of one meter down to 20 millimeters on a logarithmic scale. And the y-axis is in decibels relative to one micrometer. So zero decibels is one micrometer and 20 decibels is um, 10 micrometers um, level or 100 micrometers squared of power per unit spatial frequency, one of the meters. A spectrum is a lot more useful than, than an RMS because the level is typically greater at longer wavelengths and the, and the sharp peaks like this one uh, have less effect on RMS values. So I generate the roughness profile from this spectrum. And then suppose that the train is accelerating away from the station and we're recording the ABBA signal arising from the roughness along the train speed. And that is how the simulator um, calculates the um, axle box acceleration from a given roughness profile. And before I take the spectrum of ABBA, uh, there are some considerations to make. The power spectral density is usually calculated by the square magnitude of Fourier transform, which is called the periodogram. But if I try taking the periodogram of the roughness profile I put into the simulator, we can see that it is very noisy. And that's because the uncertainty of each value in the frequency bands is, is very large. And more specifically, the, the standard deviation is equal to the expected value for one periodogram. But this can be improved by averaging multiple periodograms using Welch's method. I've, I've decided to split the profile into 30 overlapped segments like this and average the periodograms of the segments. And you can see that it improves the accuracy of the spectrum seeing that it's not so noisy, but with the trade-off of lowering, lowering the frequency resolution. Now, the aim is to derive the spectrum of roughness from ABBA. So I split the track into 30 segments and map these segment boundaries to the ABBA signal according to the train's position over time. And then a hand window is applied to the segments like this. And I then take the periodograms of 30 segments and translate them from ABBA to roughness in the wavelength domain using the average train speed for each segment. Finally, I average the 30 periodograms to get the final spectrum of rail roughness plotted here against wavelength. And you can see that the derived spectrum is close to the actual, the specified spectrum I put into the simulator. I, I avoided a short section of track where the train is accelerating at a slow speed, which would otherwise um, smear the roughness spectrum. After testing this roughness derivation technique in the simulator, the next step is to test it on real world data. And Transport for London has kindly given us access to measurements from their ATMS trains. I've used the methods I've demonstrated to derive the roughness spectrum from the ABBA recorded on a section of Victoria line track, which is plotted in this graph next to a second roughness spectrum, which is the dashed line that was measured by a trolley instrument that was wheeled along the rail. And both plots are in close agreement at the longer wavelengths. But how did I determine the transfer function I used to derive roughness? I based the transfer function on this train track model, which closely represents a Victoria line train on underground track. I need to know the mass, damping, and stiffness of the various components in the model to determine this function. Looking at the model, 
the wheel mass, primary suspension and contact stiffness and the rail beam properties are quite easy to, to, to determine and they stay constant. However, the track support stiffness and damping vary with temperature and age as well as how the track is constructed. So in fact, to get this graph, I manually tuned the track support so that the derived spectrum is close to the measured spectrum while using known values for the other parameters. For the wavelengths shorter than 100 millimeters, the model needs to be refined to account for resonances occurring in these wavelengths, such as the train's axle beam resonance, and give a closer fit to the measurement spectrum than I have now. Now, manually tuning the model parameters is a form of calibration where you measure both rubbers roughness and ABBA on a reference section of track. Or you, or you can forego the model and simply divide the roughness spectrum by the ABBA spectrum to get the transfer function directly. This would work if the track dynamics stayed the same through the rest of the railway network outside the reference section. But in reality, they don't. And this is exemplified by two years of ABBA data recorded on the West Midland Spectra network from the earlier Vinto project. When I presented the ABBA measurements as octave band filtered RMS levels in this graph, I noticed a seasonal cycle in the levels. You can see that the 40 and 80 hertz bands increase in the summer and decrease again in the winter. And the 160 hertz bands does the same thing in the opposite direction. So how does changes in track stiffness affect ABBA for a given roughness profile. If I simulate the model with a roughness profile generated from the ISO standard spectrum with vehicle moving at 20 meters per second, which is the typical speed of a, of a tram or an underground train, then that is the resulting ABBA spectrum. If I then derive the roughness from ABBA using a simulated model, and knowing all of the model parameters I use in the simulator, I get this result, which is very close to the specified roughness. But if the track stiffness is off by 20%, I get a four decibel error at wavelengths corresponding to the resonance in the acceleration spectrum. And this last curve is for the same error in the opposite direction. This dependency on track stiffness is a problem that is perhaps blocking the widespread use of axle box accelerometers to monitor rail roughness. So I developed a solution to this problem that tracks changes in the resonances of the vehicle track system that appear in the ABBA spectrum and updates the track stiffness and damping parameters in the model accordingly in order to keep the transit function accurate for the track that the train is on. This so-called P2 resonance arises from the wheel and rail masses vibrating on the track stiffness, just like a mass on spring. And the natural frequency of this vibration, and hence the frequency of the peak in the ABBA spectrum, decreases with mass and increases with stiffness. So I can extract the track stiffness from this frequency, and the width of the peak gives the amount of damping a wider, a wider peak means there is greater damping. So to extract both the stiffness and damping, I curve fit the transfer function to the peak using a least squares algorithm in MATLAB. And as a result, is a, it has identified a stiffness within 1% of the actual stiffness or 0.7% of the actual stiffness I set in the simulator model and the damping was in, is within 15%. Now, deriving the roughness spectrum using that identified stiffness and damping gives this result, and it's very close to the specified roughness spectrum I put into the simulator. Moving on to the real world measurements from the London Underground again. On the left is the ABBA derived roughness spectrum with the track stiffness and damping calibrated manually and compared to the trolley measured spectrum as I have previously shown. On the right is the measured ABBA spectrum from the um, ATFS trains. And I've fitted the transfer function 
onto the p-to-resonance peak using the least squares algorithm, which gave values of track stiffness and damping that are close to the values I've calibrated. And the roughness derived from the average structured values is um, close to the measured roughness at the longer wavelengths. However, in a second section of track, there is a, a little peak in the measured roughness spectrum near 100 millimeters of wavelength that results in a peak in the ABBA spectrum that is not quite the P2 resonance. So the curve fitted track stiffness is too high as a result, which made the ABBA derived roughness not too accurate. So there is another way to extract the track properties from ABBA. Because the other wheel sets in the train are dynamically coupled by the rails and hence by affect the vibration of one another, if I take the cross power spectral density across PSD between two wheels on the same rail and uh, divide it by the PSD of one of the wheels, it equates to this combination of cross transfer functions between the roughness on the whim, one wheel and other at another wheel. And most importantly, it is independent of roughness in theory. Assuming that the PSD of roughness is equal at all rails, which is approximately true if you take the PSDs on a long enough section of track, there are no roughness terms in this equation. And this eliminates the problem with peaks in the underlying roughness spectrum that affected the um, previous method of extracting track stiffness. Now, to find the track stiffness and damping, bearing in mind that both the expressions in this equation, which I call cross PSD ratios, are functions of frequency. I perform a least squares fit, um, essentially minimizing the sum squared differences of this equation um, between the measured and uh, calculated uh, cross PSD ratios over a certain frequency range. And that's similar to what I did in the previous technique. In the right hand, in this graph, the solid line is from the simulated ABBA from the four wheel track model. And the dashed line is the right hand side of this equation, uh, given the same parameters as in the simulator model. And you can see that they both agree with each other, which means that this, um, this method could work. Now let's see how the theoretical cross PSD ratio varies with the track stiffness and damping. The top graph shows the effect of varying stiffness, which moves the peaks along the frequency axis left and right. And the bottom shows that reducing the damping increases the height and sharpness of the peaks. So the cross PSD ratio is reasonably sensitive to these parameters, allowing you to determine these by curve fitting the ratio to that measured by accelerometers on two wheel sets. I cannot yet test this method with the, um, with the um, real world measurements because the accelerometers are only on one wheel set on the ATMS trains. But I have tested this method in the simulator and it gives results accurate to within 10% of the actual values and are unaffected by roughness, unlike the previous Peter resonance method. To summarize, I have developed a set of signal processing techniques that together derive the roughness spectrum from axle box acceleration measured on trains in ref revenue service. I've worked out the specifics of calculating the power spectral density of ABBA in several segments, and I've derived the roughness spectrum in these individual segments using the transfer function before averaging this together to account for varying train speeds. For the transfer function, I've identified two methods to extract the transfer from the ABBA signal themselves. One is by fitting the P2 resonance and the second uses the cross PSD between the two wheels. Early testing with ATMS data from the London Underground indicates that the techniques can achieve ABBA derived roughness spectra that are close to the trolley measured spectra or CAT measured spectra. 
one more hurdle that I want to mention is that the wheel can have roughnesses as well as the rail and both roughnesses are combined in the ABBA signal. So further techniques are under, the, under development to remove the wheel roughness from the ABBA signal. These would take advantage of the fact that wheel roughness is a periodic signal, whereas rail roughness is not. Which means that the wheel roughness occurs as, as a series of regularly spaced frequencies that can be removed using a cone filter. And this will further improve the reliability of rail roughness spectra derived from ABBA. And Dr. James Talbot has supervised me through this PhD project from October 2017, and he will now give his closing comments. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go. Sorry, folks. And I've um, I've also gone and lost my um. There we go. Back. Conclusions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Tobias. Um, I I I think that, that gives an excellent flavour of your excellent work. Um, none of this stuff is um is trivial, and um, and and managing with these these huge data sets and um and and developing your your algorithm, um, you, you've done an excellent job, and um. Uh, so I think you know we're we're, we're very much on the uh, on the right track. If you'll pardon the pun, um, we've we've really got to a point now where you know that initial um, uh, work with um, Transport for West Midlands showed that uh, you know, illustrated the concept um, that, that even um, even just a crude uh, monitoring of um, vibration levels can can help identify features. Um, uh, potentially problematic features in in the track. The the more recent work, Tobias's more recent work, shows that if we if we look at the data uh, more carefully, we can start to not just look at vibration, but we can actually start to um, get insight into the underlying rail roughness itself. And and some of those um, uh, initial results, Tobias, which are how well you, you're probably. Um, Muted now. We're 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 talking. Um, I'm still. I'm still. Yeah, it's not that long. They've not been out very long, have they? Only a few few months since uh, you pulled together those. You're able to pull together those comparisons between the um, the ABBA derived roughness spectra and the um, and the measured CAT spectra. Um, and uh, yeah, we were pretty excited when we started to see those um, those comparisons. Um, uh, so as Tobias has hinted. Um, uh, some good good uh, opportunities for future work on on removing the wheel roughness. Wheel roughness is less of an issue. Um, I did see before it disappeared. Somebody uh, asked a query about um, about monitoring wheel condition. Um, wheel condition tends to wheels tend to get rough. Um, you know, you, you turn, the wheels are turned on a on a on a periodic basis uh, as part of regular maintenance uh, routine. Um, and so you take your nice shiny wheel, it develops a roughness very quickly in service, but then that stabilizes. Um, and it stabilizes at the level which is generally uh, below the, the level of roughness associated with the rails. So um, it's, it's kind of an annoyance, the wheel roughness. Um, and um, Tobias has got some good ideas on, on how to um, uh, uh, remove that. But it's um, but it's not as much a, a, de a big deal as, as the rail roughness, um, uh, and and this uh, this second point here, um, which is very much uh, current work, um, you can imagine we've we've very we've very much been putting up uh, two dimensional diagrams showing just one wheel, um, and, and monitoring the vibration of, of just the one wheel. Well, of course, particularly with these um, London London underground rolling stock they're like the conventional railway vehicles in that they've got solid axles unlike the um unlike the modern trams which have got little stub in, stub axles independent stub axles so you can imagine that you know, you've got a solid axle which very much couples um one wheel to the next um and so just monitoring vibration on one above one rail a certain amount of that signal comes from vibration of the um of the adjacent rail um, we really want. We really feel that that's the next step. If we can, if we can help account for that, then those agreements between 
uh, measured and, and derived spectra should get even better. So uh, the story very much continues um, and, um, uh, um, and we press, press on. Uh, it only, it only uh, continues uh, because of um, some fantastic support from a number of uh, partners. Um, you know, Transport for West Midlands and Centro or, or West Midlands Metro as they're now known, were, were such a fantastic industrial partner to work with. As I said, very much a can-do attitude. We had loads of fun and, um, and really interesting work with them, uh, sort of demonstrating the concept more recently, we're hugely grateful to, to John Hobbs and, and, the, and the track engineering team in London Underground. They've made their, their valuable data set accessible to us and, um, and that's really helping us um, validate um, the, the algorithms, the signal processing. Um, I've slipped in CAF because they were, they were uh, supporting um, uh, Centro with um, uh, the, 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 tra uh, the, uh, the tram uh, system. CAF are a, a tram. Uh, manufacturer. Um, and of course, all of this comes under the umbrella of CSIC, which um, I certainly am hugely um, uh, you know, grateful to be part of. Um, and, and, and I can't not mention uh, Jennifer Schooling, who had faith in uh, this crazy Vimto project and really did, uh, I won't bore you with the details, but really did rescue the project at a very difficult time uh, where, when resources were stretched. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, CSIC, for continuing to support this work.